Behold how good and how pleasant it is. This servant has been so awesome. This has been so awesome. There's a freedom in here this morning to worship God. I said that I said, you know, one of these Sundays, we are going to be in here and we're going to go until three o'clock. We're going to forget about the time. And we are just going to worship and receive from our God. This has been so, so, so awesome. As Pastor said, both services. It has been awesome. You know, in the early service, I mentioned that uh, COVID has done a work on the church. There are still many churches that are not assembling, not coming together. They are still by Zoom. If you have been following the news with Canada, I'm sure there are some other countries, I think Australia as well. But in those countries, they don't have the freedom that we have. They do not have the freedom to leave from home and say, I'm going to church to worship my God. They don't have that freedom. Do not let us lose this opportunity when it comes to worshiping your God. Don't let's lose this. You see, because if the world out their way, we wouldn't even be here this morning. The Bahamas would not have the freedom that it has. Canada is, you might as well say Canada is our neighbor. They don't have the freedom that we have to worship. They are putting pastors in prison. Not because they came into the sanctuary to worship. Because they were worshiping in their homes. In their homes. We got a lot to give God thanks for. We got a lot to give God thanks for. Every opportunity that we have to praise him, let's praise him. And you say one thing with us giving God praise. We don't have to be nowhere special to praise him. You could be in the, in, in the grocery store and you could just send up a praise. You could be at the light, the traffic light, and you could give up a praise. In the doctor's office, you can give up a praise. When you think of what God has done for you, when you think of what God is doing for you, when you think of the promises that he has for you, and as we have sung this morning, he can't fail. All of those promises for us, they are yay and amen. We got plenty to give God praise for. We got a lot to give God praise for. Give him praise. Every opportunity, wherever you are, wherever you are, give him praise. Ready you have the mutter, sometimes you may have to mutter it. Give him praise. You're in a position where you could shout it out. Give him praise. Some are wrong, you may not even understand what you're doing. Give him praise. You know, sometimes in our Christian walk, we may come to this place where we say, God knows my needs. 
He knows what I need. Why do I have to go to him and ask him for my needs? For my needs to be met. Now you, you, you may all be way up there. And the thought never came to you. But here is what Simon said, and I'm sure this could help us. Psalms 107, 28 through 30, New Living Translation. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still. Any storms in your life? So that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired haven. What storms do you have in your life that's not allowing you to get that goal? You know, two or three years ago, you sat down and you, you wrote out some goals and you planned that. In six months, this is where I want to be. In a year, this is where I want to be. In two years, in three years, What was the, the barrier for you getting where you had planned to be? In First Peter 3 and 12, it reads, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And his ears are open to their prayers. Our God's eyes are always on us. So the question I asked earlier, God knows. He knows what we are in need of. As I was going through the New Testament, I saw where there were several stories of particularly blind men who sat on the side of the road, begging alms. This morning I wanted to look at one special account. This man, who was in the right place, I would say, at the right time, and he reaped the rewards for what he did. Reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. It gives this account of this blind man. Jesus was on his final approach to Jerusalem. His final approach to Jerusalem. Early ministry was winding down. Verse 46. Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus, was, Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. Many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, 
tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus drew, threw, threw aside his coat. I want you to remember that. Jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go. For your faith has healed you. Instantly, instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. We were never given the name of this man. Bartimaeus was not his name. As a matter of fact, Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. Timaeus is Timothy. We don't know his name. We don't know his name. But oh, what he received for someone whose name is not known. I think you're going to get something from his life today. The blind beggar heard people talking about the miracles that Jesus brought. And I don't think that this blind man was really in conversation with people talking about all the miracles that Jesus performed. I think he just overheard them because he's sitting on the side of the street. So obviously when, when people pass by, they're talking about this man, Jesus, and he healed the blind, and he, he healed the lame, and he did this, and he did that. And I think all of that stuck in Bartimaeus' mind. And I could just imagine him sitting on the side of the road with no friends to take him to Jesus. And he's in, in his mind, he's saying, I want to meet this Jesus. This Jesus who's performing miracles. This Jesus who's making the blind to see. This Jesus who's making the lame to walk. I want to meet this Jesus. And lo and behold, on Jesus' Heading out to Jerusalem. That means Jesus was not going by him again. He didn't know that. But he used the opportunity to try and get Jesus' attention. The crowd, he's blind. So he's saying a lot of chatter, 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 walking, going by him. A lot of chatter, 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 chatter. Footstep walking. She was clocking on the, on, on the road. And he's sitting on the side of the road. And he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now you got to put this, picture this in your mind. The way I picture this. A crowd coming down the road. And if you remember the crowd that was with Jesus in his ministry. It was a 5,000. There was a 7,000. There was always a crowd. So this man who was sitting on the side of the road. Was below all of those people. Some of them passed him and didn't even pay attention to him. Paid no attention to him. But he said, he shouted out, not just said, he shouted out, not knowing where Jesus was. Not knowing if Jesus was just a feet away from him. Not knowing if Jesus was on the other side of the crowd, on the other side of the street. Not knowing if Jesus had already passed him and was way ahead of the 5,000 or the 7,000 or the 10,000, whatever it was. Not knowing if Jesus maybe was at the back. Didn't know where Jesus was. But he knew he needed to get Jesus' attention. 
He knew that the man who was given was, was healing the blind. He knew that the man who was healing the lame. He knew that this was his opportunity to get Jesus' attention. So he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The man needed a savior. He needed a miracle worker. He needed a healer. He needed all of that. But those around him who heard him calling out to Jesus, those who look at the blind man sitting on the side of the street, I don't know if it was because they were selfish. I don't know if they didn't have no compassion, they were no empathy. I don't know what it was. But they told him, be quiet. Jesus was in the ministry of performing miracles. I am sure they had seen many miracles that Jesus performed. And this blind man, sitting on the side of the street, sitting way below them, he is crying out to Jesus. And they said, be quiet. I don't know what it was. Were they selfish? No compassion? This is a blind man. This is Jesus who can heal this blind man, can, can, can give him his sight. Jesus heard his name being called. Jesus heard his name being called. And unlike the uncompassionate, unlike the selfish, unlike those who may say, I am on my way, I can't stop. Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. The blind man in his shouting God, Jesus' attention. God, Jesus' attention. When Jesus heard the man, immediately he stopped. Immediately he stopped. And Jesus told them, tell him to come. Tell him to come. Tell him to come. I could just imagine those who were right next to the man telling him, be quiet. They were the very one who took the man to Jesus. You got some people in your life who are detractors. You got some people in your life who are telling you, why are you shouting? You don't need to be shouting and calling on the name of Jesus that loud. You got some detractors like that in your life. You got those, you know, on the, on the job. And many people go, to, go, go to, um, to work and they try to do their devotion before it's 9 o'clock. Or 8.30 or 8 o'clock, whatever your time is to start work. And sometimes your devotion may run into you working minutes <laughs> and you may have that supervisor who come to you and said you know I don't mind you doing your devotion but you need to cut it down you're doing it too often you don't have to do all of that and I might just say you know that could be a, 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 a sister in the church Maybe not your church, another church. But they are telling you, you don't need to do all of that. You are praying and you are praying loud. And someone on the side of you trying to elbow you to tell you, you are loud. Those same people, 
as they did and they brought the blind, blind man to Jesus, God will use those same people to bring you up, to raise you up to where he wants you to be. Do hate them. Let them say what they want to say. Let them do what they want to do. But you continue to call on your Jesus. As loud as you want to. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. The very people who try to shut you up, God will use to bring you to where he wants you to be. Don't hate them. Pray for them. Don't hate them. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus summoned him, he got so very excited. He got very, very excited. What did he do? He had on a coat. But what he did, he threw that coat off. He immediately threw that coat off and came to Jesus. Now, I didn't know this before I was studying for this. But the coat was the government's license given to him so that he can beg arms. The coat was licensed for him to go on the side of the street and beg arms. But when he heard that Jesus had called him, he tossed the coat. Did you get that? Did you get that? He threw the coat away. Why? Why? He no longer needed the coat. He had gotten Jesus' attention. He didn't need the coat any longer. Wherever you are, whatever is going on with you in your home, at the workplace, whatever is going on with you, wherever, once you get Jesus' attention and you know that inner knowing in you, you know within you that yes, Jesus, Jesus heard me. You need to start peeling off some of those barriers, some of those things that was holding you back. Some of those things that are causing you to, to, to doubt. You need to start tossing some of those things off. Because you know what happened when he tore that coat? His faith, his faith arised. He demonstrated that. I don't need this coat anymore. I will not be on the side of the street any longer asking for arms. Why? Jesus, call me. Oh my God. You got to get this. Each one of you in here today, if you claim that you are a child of God, you are a daughter of God, you are a son of God, you have been called. He has called you. Whatever, whatever was trying to keep you down, whatever was trying to hold you back, Whatever it is, you need to just toss it. You don't need it any longer. Let your faith arise. Let faith step forth and receive what God has for you. You know, earlier I talked about all those promises that he has for us. There's a whole lot of promises he has for us, but we're still clinging on to the coat. We're still clinging on to that coat. So we know how. We're not demonstrating. We're not making no room for the promises to be fulfilled, to be manifested in our lives. 
Get rid of the coat. You got a coat with you now. You, do you have a coat? Think about it. What is it you're clinging to? Get rid of it. You're asking, you're calling out to Jesus and you're asking him for something. Just do an in, 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 introspection. <laughs> Just look at yourself. What is it you need to get rid of? What is it you need to get rid of? You know, the code was a license given to him by the government. Have the government given you a... Don't get offended. Have they given you a social services card? Have they given you a social services card? But deep down within you, you want a job. So when you call on Jesus, you're calling on him and saying, have mercy on me. I need a job. I don't want to be depending on this coat any longer. I want to get rid of this coat. I want to get rid of it. It's holding me back. What that coat did for him was kept him on the side of the street begging for arms. That's what that coat did. Every day he left home with that coat to go on the side of the road to beg arms. He was not free. He was in bondage. He was not free. He threw off his coat and came to Jesus. Jesus, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the Alpha and Omega. He who knows everything about us. I look at you and I see your outward appearance. Jesus looks at you. He sees your heart. He sees your heart. Nothing escapes him. Nothing escapes him. He called for this man. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? If someone, a billionaire, a millionaire, a billionaire, were to have a blind check and were to say to you, in this recessionary economy, what can I do for you? I am sure if you know that this billionaire was in the position to do anything for you, you would not hold back. Whatever figure came to your mind, that's the figure you were going to give him. Where there was more than you need, or whether it was just to meet your need. So when Jesus asked the, the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? I read in Hebrew 4 and 13. Hebrew 4 and 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Nothing. That weight, that burden that you're carrying is not hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. He is the one to whom we are accountable. I think there's going to be a lot of um, wanting to be accountable when we stand before our God, still carrying some of those, because, well, there will be no blindness, but just let's say we reach to 
Peter. <laughs> right? And Peter is looking at us. God already made it possible for you to be free of this cane. Why are you still walking with this crutch? Why were you still, forgive me, why were you still holding on to that card? Why were you still in that position where you did not want to be? You wanted to change job, but you kept it to yourself. We will be accountable for those things. Every time there was a situation in our life today, everything that you are going through right now, and you're not talking to your Lord and Master about it, you could be held accountable. You will be held accountable. You see, if you had a mortgage, and you were struggling and struggling and struggling with this mortgage. You cannot pay it. And every month, whenever the time came to pay the mortgage, you were struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling with it. And finally, the loan officer came to you and asked you, what happened? And you said, I just couldn't make the payment. What do you think he's going to say to you? So many times, opportunities are there for us. So many times, all we need to do is to just ask our Heavenly Father. That's all. That's all. But we will be accountable. But I don't want you to leave out of here today being accountable for whatever it is you are carrying today. No, you must free yourself of that today. You do not need to stand before God and try to explain why I was still holding on to that. You don't need to do that. Your God, your omnipotent God, your God who has power to do everything, anything. Even though Jesus was in constant communication with the Father, and he said he did what the Father, what he saw the Father do, what he heard from the Father, he was obedient to do it. He was obedient to do it. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? The man simply said, Rabbi, my Rabbi, I want to see. He was direct with his request. He didn't go through that long story telling Jesus how he became blind, whether it was from birth or whether he contracted a disease, whatever it was. It was not important at this time. Jesus, the miracle worker, was there. What do you need that I may see? You know all of that stuff that you may have to be going through? You got to explain to this one and explain to the, the, the next one why you can't do this and why you can't do that. Maybe even to the loan officer, why you couldn't make those payments. You may have to, you're sitting in this chair for 15, 20 minutes trying to explain why you couldn't. And all Jesus requests of you, Beverly, what do you need? All I need to say, Father, on Friday, I need to have $550. He knows everything. I need $550. I don't have to go through this long, exhaustive explanation as to why I need it. 
Just tell him. So what is it? What is it you need today? Jesus stands right next to you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So he's asking you, what do you need me to do for you? What do you need Jesus to do for you? The blind man said, I want to see. Hmm. The only other comment that came from Jesus after he said, I want to see, and get this, the comment that came from Jesus when the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Jesus simply said to the man, your faith has healed you. So you see, when I go to him and I say, Jesus, I need 550 for Friday to make that payment. That's supposed to stir some a faith in me. There should be no doubt, no double-minded. That faith should arise in me. That I know if I'm asking the way maker, I am going to the way maker. I have the attention of the way maker. And I'm asking him, do you think I need to doubt? No, my faith needs to just rise up. My faith needs to be bigger than big. Because I know I'm looking forward to a payment on Friday. Thursday, 12 a.m. May come. 11.59, 12 a.m. May come. I could go to bed. I don't have to wait up worrying about where it's coming from. This is something that we need to develop. This is something that we need to exercise. We need to be exercising the faith in what God has already given to us. This isn't something that we're going to beg for. Be not beggars. We are not beggars. Not when it comes to our Heavenly Father. We are not beggars. He sits on the throne in heaven. Jesus is making intercession for you. All that you're going through here on earth. What intercession do you think he's making if he isn't making intercession for all that you are going through? He is in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for me and for you. And I could just hear him. Oh God, Beverly, just ask. Just ask. Just ask. The Father is willing to give it to you. Just ask. Even though we know what you have need of, we need you to ask. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is, ask. Just ask. Just ask. We need to exercise our faith. We need to exercise our faith. And the more you exercise your faith, the easier it becomes. Every day you will be telling God what you need. And every day you will be looking forward to it. You will be looking forward to it because you have faith. You see, this blind man had no doubt that the miracle worker, the one who was healing all those other blind people, he had no doubt that when Jesus asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, that I may see. He had no doubt. He left his coat. He left his coat. He had no doubt that when he leave from there, he would be seeing. He would be seeing. Think about it. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Can you call out to him to get his attention? Jesus, thou son of God, 
have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me. Get his attention. And when you know that you have gotten his attention, as I told the early church, and yes, I experienced it since then. I know he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I know he is here with me always. But you know, sometimes you just want to experience that. I don't know why what happened to you where you get a burning in your hand, where you get a burning in your, some part of your body. I don't know how you experience when he is there, when you, when you know you got his attention. I don't know how you experience it. I know how I experience it. So when I call on him and I say, Jesus, I want to feel your presence. Can I tell you? He never disappoints. He never, never disappoints. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. He do not disappoint us. We sang about it. We sang about it. We couldn't even get off the song. Please leave for me today. Leave for me today. And say I got to exercise my faith more. Because you're exercising faith. I don't doubt that you are exercising faith. But we need to do it a little bit more. Jesus told us that we will be doing more. Didn't he say we will be doing more? He said that we will be doing more. So we should see more blind eyes open. We should see more lame walking. Because we should be doing more. Oh God, Sharon, it's time for me to go. <laughs> you know, it's my desire. There has been so many prophecy about the temple. You may not have been here to hear any of them, but I heard prophecy about the temple. One particular that I heard that those who were here, I don't think we would ever miss it. Even before this church was erected, the prophecy that there would be people lined up on Collins Avenue to get into evangelistic temple. What do you think they're coming for? What do you think they're coming for? They're coming to be amongst people who, is, who are exercising their faith. Exercising their faith so that whatever it is they need, they know that when they enter this temple, when they leave from this temple, those needs are met. We need to exercise our faith a little bit more. Exercise it a little bit more. Leave from here thinking about Bartimaeus. Two things he demonstrated faith for. He had that coat that the government gave him, that gave him a license to sit on the side of the road to beg arms. And as soon as he heard that Jesus had called him, he tossed it. What do you need to toss? What do you need to throw away? What do you need to get rid of? And when Jesus asks, what can I do for you? He was direct in saying that I may see. What do you need from Jesus? You got some loved ones who need salvation, deliverance. What is it you need from Jesus? Call him up and tell him what you want. Amen. God bless you.